Good morning. We welcome you to the celebration of life for Susan Short. We are glad that you are here and all of our friends who are tuning in live online for this broadcast. And for those of you who would like to watch it again later in the day or throughout the week, you can find it at epworth.com slash sermons. We're glad that you're here to celebrate the life of a very unique, beautiful, and positive thinking woman who shared that light and that hope with her loved ones and her friends and all of those that she came in contact with, including students from all over Ohio who were inspired in their musical careers by her encouragement and by her talent. Would you join me as we pray? Dear Lord, we gather here in this sacred place, in this holy moment, to remember and to celebrate the life of one of your servants, a wife, mother, sister, friend, fellow believer in Christ. We thank you for what she means to each individual here and all of those who are tuning in. May this legacy of hope and faith and love continue in the days and months and years to come so that we are not celebrating someone who has passed away or gone somewhere else, but someone who is just as alive and real to us now as she ever was. We thank you for Susan, Lord. We celebrate her life now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand as you are able and sing with us hymn number 139, Praise to the Lord the Almighty, the King of Creation. 139. Please be seated. One day our Lord God decided to make a truly beautiful soul. This child of God would have a captivating physical beauty that would be surpassed only by her quick wit and exquisite soprano voice. 
God chose Maynard and Marion Short to parent this precious soul. And on July 4th, 1950, their little firecracker was born in Wasseon, Ohio. They named her Susan Lillian. Susan's three brothers, Douglas, Stephen, and Mark, thought this precious baby was awfully small and dubbed her Little Baseball Head. I'm sure it was said with love. Susan graduated Wasseon High and had dreams of using her beautiful singing voice to entertain and to educate. She earned degrees from BGSU in music education and Western Michigan for vocal music performance. Susan found her calling on stage. At BGSU, she played Maria in West Side Story. At Western Michigan, she played the lead in Most Happy Fella. She was a champagne lady on the Lawrence Welk Show in 1975, and she shared her talent with us in this very room. Susan was a beautiful woman, so beautiful that in her 20s, she entered a few minor pageant competitions. The little firecracker was soon named Miss Northwest Ohio, Miss Heart of Michigan, and Miss Michigan, 1974. She competed in the Miss America pageant in Atlantic City and, of course, won the talent competition. She went on to serve as a pageant judge and coach, helping others to reach for their dreams as well. Susan married Dr. Benjamin Shane in 1983, and they had two wonderful sons, David and Michael. Susan was eternally proud of her boys. If you asked her about herself, she would always begin and end with stories about Michael. There were probably a few in the middle as well. If there was a single thing that Susan actually did fail at, it would have been containing an ounce of pride or adoration for her boys. The last conversation Susan and I had was about David and Michael. In 2005, Susan married a BGSU classmate, Roger Short. They shared a love of music and a devotion to their Christian faith and quickly discovered they were soulmates. Susan and Roger performed together on several occasions, including their own wedding. Susan often described to me how devoted and tender Roger was, especially when caring for her when she became ill. Susan Lillian Short was welcomed home by her Lord on August 25, 2020. Her family always touched her heart. Now as she walks with our Lord and sings on the grandest of stages, our hearts are touched by the memory of a soul beautiful in every way a great wife, a wonderful mother, a devoted sister, a dear friend. She is loved. She is missed. Amen. I know that there may be some friends and family who may want to say a word or two about Susan, now is the appropriate time to do that. If you would like to join us here at the um, pulpit, you'd be more than welcome to do so. I think, Roger, you have a few words. Would you like to start us? You want to finish? Okay. Anybody that would like to start us, and then Roger will wrap everything up at that point. Good morning. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Susan's brother, Mark, her younger brother. My memories of Susan is that she was truly a, life, a lifelong nurturer. After two boys were born, Steve and Andy, and then she was born, she wanted very much to have a little sister, but along came me. And I'll tell you, 
She was six years older than I, but she tried to raise me as if I was one of her own, and she often received pushback. She constantly advised me on my eating habits and was fiercely protective of my parents whenever she thought I might be taking advantage of my position as baby of the family. We played countless board games together in our youth. Scrabble was probably our favorite. And I seldom lost, simply because whenever she had the upper hand, I would take my right hand and clear the board. Dad had some nicknames for Susie that you probably never heard before, one of which was Squirrely Bell, another of which was Flatfoot Susie. They called her Flatfoot Susie, Dad did, because in spite of her, her small stature, you could always hear her coming. It was thump, 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 thump. You heard her coming from a mile away. I so remember when I was a boy how protective she was of my parents' finances. She had, Dad had a little change cup in the kitchen that he kept you know, quarters in that he would take to work for you know, things that, to, to eat at lunchtime. And, Every once in a while, I would receive a call from friends and say, let's go uptown and play pinball. Well, that required a quarter. And to get that quarter, I had to go to this little change cup in the kitchen. So I would very strategically wait until Susan was in the other end of this huge house, and I would reach my hand in that cup, trying to avoid the inevitable clink. And then suddenly there would be a clink. And then the next thing you would hear is thump, 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 thump. She came at me with all her ferocity, and sometimes I would escape with the quarter and played ping pong or ping ball, and other times she would uh, retrieve it from my hands and return it to the change cup. <sighs> Susie, I was always so proud of your prodigious singing, your pageants, and your careers, but never so proud of you as the courageous battle you waged for the last three years against cancer all the way to the end. You know, life has certain symmetries to it. Uh, I must admit that Susie had another sister. Uh, believe it or not, on August 25th, 1961, Marcy Louise Short was born, Susie's little sister, my little sister. She only lived for five minutes until sturdy hands took her away forever. Susie mourned her loss always. Well, incredibly enough, on August the 25th, the same day, 59 years later, Susan was taken away by the same sturdy arms of the Lord. I'm sure they celebrated Marcy's 59th earthly birthday in God's eternal kingdom. Susie, your voice is now restored to its glory and your health will be forever perfect. I love you, Susie. And until the day that sturdy hands come for me, I shall miss you deeply. Love you. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm David. Susan was my mom. Um, I'm sure everyone here will agree that my mother had uh, quite a few very unique accomplishments over her lifetime. Um, very gifted musician, actress, many other things as well. Um, you know, of course, she was Miss Michigan, like it's been mentioned already. Um, there's one particularly fond memory of her that I would like to, would like to share. Um, so, way back when my mom started a production of The Sound of Music, I think it was 2002 or 2003, I was 13 or 14 years old, um, she frequently went to various concerts and plays, and back then she was always dragging me to them. Of course, as a teenager, I didn't really have a whole lot of interest in that kind of thing, and uh, usually did my best to get out of them. But since she was actually performing in this particular production, I kind of felt obligated to be there. Um, 
So anyway, in The Sound of Music, she um, landed the role of Mother Abyss, um, and I came to several of rehearsals and whatnot, and quickly realized this was sort of a big thing. You know, I was going to be at the Valentine Theater in downtown Toledo, and they were going to perform the play uh, multiple times over several days. Uh, hundreds of people were expected each day. Um, I did watch the various rehearsals, and despite the fact that uh, theater in general really wasn't that interesting to me at the time, um, I started to get very intrigued by this play. Um, I really started to enjoy watching everyone perform, especially my mom, of course. Um, and I gained, you know, an appreciation for how truly talented she really was. Um, I don't really think most actors in Hollywood even have half of her talent. Um, when the actual performance rolled around, despite the fact that this was very much, you know, her day and everything, um, as a testament to her selflessness, um, she talked to the sound guy, the sound technician on set, and uh, convinced him to let me stay backstage during the first performance and actually run the soundboard during the, uh, during the play. Um, which I remember just was a really cool experience. Um, and as a side note, I think the sound guy should probably should have given me a bit more supervision uh, during the play. <laughs> there was a point during the play where uh, there was a sound effect that was supposed to happen at a very specific point in time, and I think I ended up pressing, pressing the button about 10 seconds too early. So it uh, didn't really make a whole lot of sense to everyone in the audience. But. Uh, anyway, for whatever reason, um, when I think about good times I've had with my mom, this is uh, you know, one of the first memories that always comes up. Um, and just one more thing to say. Um, when I was writing this ULG, I Googled a few things about the sound of music just to make sure I kind of had my facts straight and everything. And um, I came across this website that sort of outlined the various qualities that someone should have um, before being cast as Mother Abyss in the Sound of Music. Um, and to quote that website, the, those qualities were motherly, understanding, strong and authoritative, but kind. Um, I really don't think I could come up with a better seven words to describe my mom. So anyway, that's all I have. Thank you all so much for being here. I really appreciate it. Hello. My name is Michael Shane. I'm uh, David's younger brother. For youngest son. Thanks for all, thanks everyone for being here. My mom was so many things, a creative and eloquent musician, a patient teacher, a pageant queen, a person who could always make me laugh and knew what to say. But the one hat she wore meant so much more to her, her mother hat. She lived to be a mother. She was always, always in tune with David and my feelings. She knew when to make us laugh and she knew when to be quiet and listen. She would do anything and everything for us from laying on top of us in a closet during a tornado. David and I were a lot smaller back then, I guess. <laughs> um, from doing that, from consistently cooking us our favorite meals, she spoiled us a lot with that, showing intrigue and supporting in all our weird hobbies and interests, and of course, taking us to Chuck E. Cheese and Cedar Point to see our cousins in Wapakoneta pretty, pretty frequently. As a wonderful as a mother she was to David and I when we were kids, she was even better as a mother when we started to really grow up. When I was starting college at the University of Illinois, seven hours away from Toledo, I was a freshman and I was extremely homesick during my first year of college. Despite my mom's busy job as a teacher at St. Joseph's School in Sylvania, she offered to take the day off one day just so she could come drive herself to Champaign, just to sit with me while I studied for a few hours so that I would feel more at home. And then she was gonna be driving back that same night. I said no since I knew that that would make too much out of her, but I knew she wouldn't hesitate to follow through. She would literally do anything for David and I, even if it helped us a minuscule amount while severely affecting her. I felt so special she was my mom, and that because she was our mom, she would do these things for us, and that was the reason why, but this wasn't totally accurate. As I became older, I realized even more how so many people relied on her for empathy, advice, and a listening ear. She taught me the value of finding meaning in life through being there for others when they needed it most. She would literally do anything for any anything for family and friends as well, and even sometimes strangers. She once met a gas station clerk the day before Thanksgiving. After t talking to the clerk for a few minutes, my mom discovered that this clerk would also be working on Thanksgiving. And on the day of, my mom brought a full dinner from our holiday to the clerk, just to make that person's life just a tiny bit better. I've always taken it upon myself to be even slightly as gracious as her in how I treat and take care of others. I really hope that after hearing this, you all help her live on by being there for others when they need you or don't need you. You do the little things when no one is watching and when you don't have to. To love others through action, as she did. She wasn't just a mom to David and I. She was a mother and best friend to all of us. 
and she'll be surely missed. Susan and I were married for just a little over 15 years when she passed away. It was a second marriage for both of us. We knew each other long ago. Her, our hometowns were very close. Mine was Archbold, hers was Wasion. And she was a couple years younger than me, but we knew each other back when we were in high school. She was a very beautiful young lady and a very talented musician. We both ended up attend attending Bowling Green State University, where we graduated from with degrees in music. We were good friends in college. We sang in the collegiate chorale together, but we never dated because I didn't ask her out. She was a very beautiful young lady. Like I say, there was a lot of competition. I didn't figure I had a chance, so I never even asked her out. Uh, we graduated from BG. We went our separate ways. She uh, ended up living in several different cities, whereas I've lived my entire life in Northwest Ohio. But uh, she eventually ended up back in the Toledo area and she had a job teaching music at St. Joseph School in Sylvania. She taught music there for quite a few years. We had not seen each other in at least 25 years. We met up at a music contest. We were both teaching music at the time, and she recognized me first, and we met up there, and one thing led to another, and we ended up getting married on July 16, 2005. We had some wonderful years and experiences together. We had plans to do much more together after she retired from teaching, but it wasn't to be. For at least the last four years of her life, she'd been dealing with serious health issues, most notably cancer, and of course it had a terrible effect on both of our lives. When it was discovered just back in July that cancer had returned to her brain and that it was inoperable and terminal, she became bedridden and she needed a lot of care. I want to take this opportunity to thank the nurses and staff of Home Hospice, Hospice Care, who did a wonderful job of coming into our home and looking after her and, and providing care for her. I really appreciate the job that they did. But she also needed a lot of care from me, day and night. And uh, I am so glad, I'm so glad that I was in a position that I was able to provide that care for her. And I hope that I did a good job of it. But I know this. Where she is now, she's getting the best of care. I love you, Susie, and I will see you there someday.
Hear these words from John chapter 14, verses 1 through 14. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again, and I will take you to myself, so that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, then you know my Father also. From now on, you do know him, and you have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and we will be satisfied. And Jesus said to him, Have I been with you all this time, and still you do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. But if you do not, believe in me because of the works themselves. Very truly, I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do, and in fact will do greater works than these, because I am going to the Father. I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified through the Son. Whatever you ask in my name, I will do it. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Compared to many of you in this room today, I knew Susan for a very short period of time. I'm the associate pastor here at Epworth, and my primary role is congregational care. Um, I do a lot of hospital visits, a lot of home visits, visits with our homebound members. But the brevity of time that you get to know somebody in that context, it's one of the downsides of being a pastor at times. It's our blessing and honor to walk with people during their difficult times and to hopefully bring comfort and reassurance, but those seasons are often brief. In my visits with Susan at home and in rehabilitation, I was there as a pastor of congregational care. Often when I arrived, she was on the phone with a friend. (laughs) During our visits, we talked about scripture, And we talked about what heaven looks like. And we prayed. But it wasn't long before I connected with Susan as a parent, as a mother. I have two daughters, both students in Sylvania schools, one on clarinet and one on flute. (laughs) And she has her boys, Michael and David, and her anchor, Roger. And the love she has for you truly extends beyond this earthly life. During our visits, we spend about 10% of our time talking how she was doing right that second. And 30% we spent talking about faith and salvation. And the other 60%, as Pastor Jennifer alluded to, was talking about Michael and David and Roger. I think those ratios had to do with the fact that she was well aware of her health situation, and it just was. She was sure of her love for God and God's love for her, but she wanted to sort through some of the finer details of what everlasting life means. And she was only too happy to bubble over with joy about her boys. She was and is incredibly proud of you, all three of you. And she prayed that you would find peace and love. 
She worried about how you will feel after she's gone. She wanted you to remember to rest and take time for yourselves and not let the days go by too quickly. She wants you to be happy and content. I remember shedding tears along with her because as a mother myself, I wondered if I would miss my children and the people who loved me, or if my joy would be so complete in the Lord I would have blessed assurance and know that the Lord has amazing plans for you and that the Lord's grace would be with you and give you peace. And I believe in the latter. Susan wondered if she would be watching over you after she's gone. She's pretty strong-willed. So I'm guessing that's a yes. You will see or hear or smell or taste or do something that will remind you of your mother, Michael and David. And I hope you can feel the light of maternal love in your hearts. Roger, Susan loved you and worried about you. And boy, did she appreciate you and admire you. You had a beautiful duet together in the midst of a grand symphony. Remember, you are not a soloist and that your friends will be your orchestra when you need them. Susan was confident in the love of the Lord. She was reconciled with him and as John 14 said, she knew the way to the place where he was going. Be confident in her joy and in her peace and in her unending love for all of you. Well, thank you, Cecil and Barbara, for that beautiful music. And thank you, Reverend Irwin and Reverend Bailey, for your care for Susan and Roger and the family over these last many months and years. And to each of you for being an important part of the friends and family. Those who cared so much and walked a long life with Susan. What impacted me about her is her positive attitude and her positive look on life. Because that's what I preach about every weekend here. But how to accentuate the positive, how to focus on the good things in life. In the Christian church, we believe your last breath on this earth is your first breath in another reality called heaven where you are welcomed with the loving arms of those who have gone before you. And you find your home. Now, if we were to whittle down the Bible to the most important verse in the entire book, you heard it read this morning. If we had to just pick a few words out of the entire, the entire history of Christianity and that which is contained in the book called the Holy Bible, you heard the most important words. Because Jesus is telling us where the rubber meets the road. What happens to us when we leave this place and we go to the next? He says, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I will come back and take you to the place where I am going. We don't know the way, Lord. How can we know the way? Thomas asks. Well, the interesting thing about that is... um, Wherever I go, anywhere across the country, around the world, and I run into people who either go to church every week or who never go to church, people who are students of the Bible and people who know nothing about it, but they know these words. They're that iconic all over the world. No matter what language people speak, what their background is, they know these words. You do know the way because I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Now, Susan knew that. In fact, sharing her faith was so important to her, to her family and to others. Sharing her faith and the way she lived her life was an important thing to her. She said that to me more than once. How she longed for those around her to know of her faith and to accept that for themselves. I think that's a beautiful tribute. 
We don't necessarily understand what happens, do we? When we take our last breath here and our first breath there, it's, it's hard for us to conceptualize. We sort of understand it, but we're not quite sure. What is it going to feel like? What is it going to be like? I like the way uh, Senator John Glenn described his death just prior to passing from this life to the next. He said, I, I'm thinking of it as an adventure, like, uh, like I'm preparing for another space exploration. And what I said to her on that phone call and what I said to people here in all of our different worship services is this. It is better to live for a week believing you're going to live for two years than to live for two years believing you're going to die every single day. And that's exactly what she believed. And so she approached this time in her life as I'm going to live as long as possible and make as much impact as possible for as long as I can. And how I loved that about her. I said, Susan, you are a wonderful example, and I'm going to preach to a lot of people about that story that you've just shared with me and this exchange that we've had over the phone. We've already talked about her love for those of you gathered here today, and particularly those here on the front row and other family members who are scattered across the sanctuary. What a beautiful thing it is to know that you are loved, to know that others care about you that much. And so we do not come to the sanctuary today with our heads hung low, although we do feel the, the sadness of someone leaving. It's a momentary sadness because we know that she has not really left, has she? She is still deep within your heart. Her love is still with you as strong as ever, ever it was. Her spirit is with you as strong as ever it was. And one day, as you heard Roger say moments ago, you will be reunited. But until then, let's take a page out of her book. I would love for us all to take a page out of Susan's book today and to say, you know what? I'm going to live life to the fullest every single second I've got. And I'm going to be as positive as I can be, even if negative things are coming my way. I'm going to, I'm going to push back with positive hope and faith and love and light. And I'm going to hang in there and help other people hang in there for as long as humanly possible. A couple of years ago, I was talking to a family who uh, were members of my church. Their child, seven years old, was diagnosed with a serious cancer. And one day as I was visiting with that family, the parents and the young man, he looked up at me and his parents and he said, does it hurt to die? Quick tears sprang to his parents' eyes and I'm going to be honest with you, I had to choke back a couple myself. And I said to him, uh, after a quick prayer, God, give me the words to say. I said, do you remember how uh, a year or two ago you would be playing and you would play so hard during the day that you would be so exhausted that you would just come in and fall against the couch, lay down on the couch and fall asleep. But the next morning, you awoke in your own room with all of your toys around you, all of your posters on the wall, your baseball caps and your uh, basketball and all the other toys and sports memorabilia around you. He said, yes, I remember that. I said, well, you know how that happened is because sometime during the night while you were sleeping, your father or your mother came down, lovingly scooped you up, carried you very carefully, very safely up to your room, placed you in your bed, made sure the covers were up, on top of you so you would be safe and warm. And you woke up the next morning in your room prepared just for you. Well, friends, Susan fell asleep somewhere in the wee hours of the morning on 25th of August. And she awoke and awakened in her own room prepared just for her, full of love and light and love for eternity. Now, the love story between her and Roger is a beautiful one. I love the fact that they knew each other in high school. I love the fact that they knew each other in college. I love the fact that they did music together. What a beautiful thing for her children to talk to Roger about. What was it like to know, to know our mother in, in high school? What was she like back then? What was it like to be with her in college? What a beautiful gift to get that. Wouldn't that be something to have? 
And then to see them reconnect when he tells me that story and he told a piece of it today. He's happy to say that she recognized me first. I think that's fantastic. And they got together all those years later. And as they were preparing their wedding ceremony, they thought to themselves, you know, we both love music. We both teach music. We both perform music. Wouldn't it be something to bring that together as a part of our wedding ceremony? Now, I've had this DVD we're about to watch for several days, but I purposely did not watch it. And so those of you who are not at the wedding ceremony and did not see it in person and have not seen it yet, I wanted to watch it for the first time with you. I wanted to experience it for the first time with you. What a wonderful way to kind of bring this service to a crescendo is to see two people who have known each other forever and who have fallen in love and who now are forming a family together in their wedding ceremony to sing a song of faith that says we believe in God, we believe in Jesus, and we want to sing that as a part of our... I wish I had the guts to do something like that. It takes a lot of guts a lot of talent, and a lot of love to do what we're about to see. So before we watch it, let me just conclude with this statement. In the Jewish tradition, they have a phrase, and that phrase is the biggest compliment they could give. When someone passes, they say, may your memory be a blessing. We know the memory of Susan Short is a blessing to all of those who know her, who encountered her, and who felt the faith and the strength that flowed from within. Let's watch uh, a song that sings words of faith, the Lord's Prayer, the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples and all of us, as sung by Roger and Susan Short.
That was beautiful. I loved every second of that, and I know that you did too. In just a moment, we're going to conclude this portion of the service. We thank all of our friends who have tuned in live and those who will be watching this broadcast in the days to come. We thank all of you for being here in person and celebrating the life of Susan today. In just a moment, I'm going to give the closing prayer, and then we will sing number 711, for all the saints who from their labors rest. You're invited to uh, the Toledo Memorial Garden where we will do the internment for Susan and have another special blessing over her final earthly resting place, although we know that that is just, I like to call this our earth suit because we take it off, we leave it here, but our spirits are forever with the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Now, Susan, as you know, was very faithful to this church, and even when she was not able to come in person, she would tune into our broadcast every single week. And so she's heard the benediction that I'm about to give to you many times. She believed it, she lived it, and now she is experiencing it. So would you receive now, please, our closing prayer. My friends, may you go now in the power of our risen Savior, Jesus Christ. May he be with you every moment of every day. And you're going out, and you're coming in. And you're laboring, and you're leisure, and you're laughter, and even in the midst of an occasional tear. Until you come to stand before Jesus, And that day in which for you and for me, there will be no sunset, no dawning, only light and life and love forevermore. Amen.